As a rooted deeply and forward-looking community, we hope that you will be blessed by this message. For more information, visit rechurchza.com. So when we met Denny and Vanessa, uh, there was a connection that God made. It's like a brother that you never knew you had. And so that really is what the friendship is based on. We had many nights going till one o'clock in the morning, talking about the Lord, getting excited. And when you find those people, you know that it's something that the Lord is in. And so honestly, it's a privilege for me and I let to, to be here this morning, um, to connect with you guys and to see how we can help. How we can help remembrance go into the fullness of what the Lord is for your lives. So uh, I brought one of our friends, dear friends, Rudo uh, and Elsebi. Elsebi's not here this morning. Rudo is here. Rudo, don't you want to stand? He's on eldership with me at the base. So you can give him a warm welcome. Um, our friendship started with the planting of the base uh, in, the, in the West Rand, and our friendship started with friction. Just man passionate for the Lord, another man passionate for the Lord, but having to learn how do we work together and what the Lord has for us. And I can only say that friction has produced something so rare and so beautiful that I would trust this man with my life. He knows everything about us. He knows everything about my family. He is closer than a brother. And so sometimes you find the connections just through coffee and it just happens. Sometimes you find those connections through friction. But if you're humble enough, the Lord will do amazing things with the people that he sends your way. Fred and Yolanda, they're from a church that we're just starting off in uh, Centurion, a couple months old, really. Don't you guys want to stand? Um, Laka, welcome to have you guys with us as well. Any, what time do you normally finish this meeting? Okay. Okay, that's dangerous. Because uh, when Paul had an opportunity like this, he preached right through the night. One of the guys fell out of the window and he had to raise him from the dead. And I trust this morning I wouldn't have to do that to, to raise anyone. I trust this evening I don't have to do that, raising anyone from the dead. But please open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 16. And uh, I contacted Henny about two weeks ago. I was standing in, in the midst of worship at the base in Wilder's Drift. And while I'm standing in worship, I felt the Lord say, phone Henny and ask him whether you can come and help. Now, we've ha I've had invites. Henny said to me, please come. I never felt a release to come. But this morning, I can honestly say that I'm here because the Lord sent me. Now, what I've learned in ministry, in my short little bit of ministry, you get some people really <laughs> mad you get some people really sad, or you get some people really excited for the Lord. I trust that this morning you'll get excited. I want to ask you, there's something that happens when you, can, when you can receive the message that comes through the messenger that the Lord says, sends. I'm not here to self-proclaim. I'm just saying, guys, if you can open your heart this morning, the Lord is going to do some profound stuff in your life. Because I'm not here to try and, try and proclaim me or myself. I'm here to proclaim this morning what the Lord has for remembrance. And so I want to talk about this morning, jo joining Jesus in his building work. I want to talk to you about what it looks like to join Jesus in the building work that he's doing on the earth. Now, many believers want the blessing work of Jesus. Who's blessed this morning by Jesus? Wonderful. All of us want the blessing. I like it when Jesus blesses me. Last night I got blessed. A good prophetic friend of mine passed away just recently. And last night I, I, I got blessed with some of the clothes out of his wardrobe. Three jackets. I don't know how many shirts. Nice jerseys. So some people are looking for the prophet's mantle. I got his jackets, his shirts, and his jerseys. That's a blessing, isn't it? I like it when the Lord blesses me. But there's something far bigger that our lives are about and should be about. It's around joining the work of the Lord in what he's doing and building. This morning, I trust that I will bless you. Really, it is my heart. Can we settle that? I really want to bless you. But my heart for you this morning is not just to bless you, it's to get you to enlist in the building work that Jesus wants to do. Therefore, some stuff has to be spoken through. Some stuff has to be confronted in our hearts to make sure that we just don't stay in blessing. We actually sign up for the building work. 
Early this morning, the Lord woke me up with a dream. And in this dream, there were three siblings, and they inherited a massive mansion by the coast. It felt like an Italian villa. It was overseeing or overlooking the sea. The three siblings were distracted. They received the blessing of this massive home, but the home started to become run down a little bit. And the, the leader of the three siblings, his whole focus was to get the siblings to come and join the community at a table where there was games being played. His whole focus was to get entertained. And so in my dream, this, this older sibling said to the other two, don't worry about the house so much. Let's just get to the community hall and just go and play some games with the community. And I'm like, yes, Lord, what does that mean? First you say, yes, Lord, is there anything in my life? I don't know what you do when you dream. Then I felt the Lord say, no, no, it's, it's for this morning. It's for this morning where I believe the Lord wants to highlight to you that there's a huge difference between getting entertained or actually investing yourself in the purposes of God. And so let's look at this in Matthew chapter 16. I love the book of Matthew. It's a whole book about the kingdom, how the kingdom of God manifests in the earth. So if you want to know how to get the kingdom of God to start to operate through your life, read Matthew. It starts with Jesus the king coming to people, and you start to see what it looks like when the kingdom manifests. But let's read together in Matthew chapter 16, verse 13. If you don't have your Bible, please repent and bring it next time when you come to church. There's people that died for this book. I want to encourage you, get the hard copy. I know that we've got amazing technology today. Get the hard copy. It never fails to open. <laughs> They're right. Matthew chapter 16, verse 13. It says, when Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. But what about you, he asked. Who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Jesus replied, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by man, but by my Father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. And the gates of Hades will not overcome it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. And then he warned his disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Christ. Verse 21 says, from that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders the chief priests and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. Peter, look, Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Never, Lord, he said. This shall never happen to you. Jesus turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You're a stumbling block to me. You do not have in mind the things of God, but the things of men. Then Jesus said to his disciples, if anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for me will find it. What good will it be for a man if he gains the whole world yet forfeits his soul? Or what can a man give in exchange for his soul? For the Son of Man is going to come in his Father's glory with his angels, and then he will reward each person according to what he has done. I tell you the truth, some who are standing here will not taste death before they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Holy Spirit, this morning we need you. We need you for clarity. We need you for conviction. And I ask this morning, Lord, that you'll anoint me afresh to serve your people well. Holy Spirit, I ask that while the word is being preached, I pray that those who hear the word, that their hearts would start to burn inside of them. 
Jesus, thank you for the incredible blessing we have to be a part of your kingdom. And I pray this morning that you will raise up a people at remembrance that will say yes to the building work that you've called them to. We bless you this morning, Lord. Amen. I want to draw your attention to what happens in this passage. It's quite a long passage, isn't it? It's quite a long passage. I love to read long passages, passages in the Bible because then I can preach short. Because the Word carries the conviction. If you simply open your, yourself to the Word, the Spirit that wrote this Word will start to do some stuff in your heart. But I want to draw your attention to Peter. He's a central figure in the story. It's a central figure in this story. He's a central figure in the, in the story of the church. Now, you know, some, of, some, some portions of the church has really made him the one to worship. But in this portion, I want to draw your attention to the fact that Peter gets a revelation. He gets the revelation of revelations. If you don't have revelation on this, you got, you're in trouble. He gets a revelation on who Jesus is. And Jesus says, Peter, on this revelation, I will make my church be built. I will make this revelation the key, key, key revelation that my church will be built on. And so in this moment, when Peter gets revelation, he becomes a building block. Jesus says to him, Peter, I'm, I'm going to use you as a major building block for my church. The revelation and the praise and the accolades are still hanging in the air like warm bread. You can still smell the awesomeness of being commended by Jesus when Peter takes his next step and he puts himself in trouble. Jesus says, okay, now that you get the revelation of who I am, let me tell you about my purposes. I'm here to die. Peter's like, oh my goodness. I'm not going to make that happen. I'm going to prevent you, Jesus. I'm going to prevent you from fulfilling your purposes on the earth. And what does Jesus say to Peter? He says, Peter, this moment I commended you for being a building block because you had revelation. But now you've crossed over into the realm of reason and now you're a stumbling block to me. Yo, yo, hanging out with Jesus is not comfortable sometimes. It's so nice when he pats you and he commends you and he says, hey, well done, man, you really are a blessing. But there's times when Jesus has to confront our reasoning because we're not building blocks, we become stumbling blocks in what Jesus wants to build. So I want to talk to you this morning about the difference. If you're going to join the building work that Jesus is doing and he wants to do at Remembrance Church, you're going to have to learn how to become a building block. How? By walking with revelation. People that walk with revelation, they're building blocks in the church. They're building blocks in the kingdom of God. People that walk with reasoning become stumbling blocks. Can I say hallelujah, amen? Excited about that. Because you're also sitting with question marks. Like, can he send this guy back to the West Rand? <laughs> it's so vitally important, friends, that we get revelation. If we're going to be part of what Jesus is building in the earth today, we need to live with revelation. The problem is sometimes we get revelation and we start reasoning the revelation away. I wish it was different, but it's not. See, so if we're going to join Jesus in the building work, what revelation do we need to have? Thank you for asking the question. We need to have the revelation on who Christ is. You can come to church all your life. You can come to wonderful prayer meetings and you can try and read your Bible, but unless you have this revelation that Peter got, you're not really part of the church. You're just a visitor to the church. Now, we want people to visit the church, isn't it? Do you want people to visit the church? So when last did you invite your neighbor to come? Just asking. Why do we want them to visit the church? Because when they hear the preaching of the word and they have the work of the Holy Spirit, they too can get this revelation of who Jesus is because without this revelation, you're simply just playing games. 
You simply playing church. You are not the church yet. So what's the revelation that Peter gets? It says in verse 16 of Matthew chapter 16. Uh, sorry, verse yeah, verse 16. He says, "You are the Christ, the Son of the Living God." He has the revelation of all revelations. This is the mother of all revelation. You're right. This mother will have other children along the way. But this is the one you need to get. Who is Jesus to you? Peter says, listen, this man that's walking in front of me, this man is not just a cool, good-looking guy. This man is God. My goodness. Imagine that. How did she figure that out? You don't figure it out. It comes by revelation to you. That God is walking around in a, in a human suit. He left heaven. He's walking amongst us. He's living amongst us. And the things that he's doing is God doing it with the limitations of a human frame. In full submission to the Holy Spirit. Wow. Think about this. The second person of the Godhead humbled himself, took on a body just like yours, and said, I'm going to live my life in full dependence of the Holy Spirit. He's going to lead me. I'm going to listen to him. And everything he wants me to do, I'll just simply do it. Did you get that revelation about who Jesus is? So let's test that revelation. If you have that revelation that you know that Jesus was a man and that he was living by the Spirit, how are you doing and living with the Spirit. Is he on your body like he was on Jesus' body? Hey, man, I rock it like he better remember it. Some of you remember the old days. Your stories are as of old. When the Spirit came on me, what's happened to your life in the Spirit? Remember it? Jesus as a man, lived as a man, he paid as a man, he paid in blood so that you can be right with God. And when you get born again, the life of God is inside of you. Why? Because he's done it. And when you get baptized in the Holy Spirit, the power of God comes on you just like Jesus had power. Hey, that power is something. That power makes you look radical. Makes you do radical things. To the world, you look like a fruitcake. <laughs> but you can do some stuff. You get to a wedding and they run out of wine. You say, bring the water. I'll multiply. Some of you think, yes, that's a neat party trick. Wherever Jesus went with his body under the reality of the Spirit, he could bring solutions to people. Did you get that revelation yet? But this man is not just an ordinary man. This man is God. When he's dying on the cross, it is God dying on your behalf. Now, some of you are not so convinced that God did a good job at dying for your sin. So you're trying to help him with some of your performance mentalities. How's it looking? How's it going for you? There's no joy at the end of that. You know where the joy comes from in our faith? It comes from realizing that this man was God. And when God paid for me and he forgave me my sin, my sin has been forgiven. Why? Because God says so. You're not happy? If you're going to join Jesus in the building work, you have to get the revelation that he's the cornerstone of your faith, that he is fully God and he's fully man. And you build your life of faith from that foundation. Somewhere in your life of faith, something goes wrong because that foundation of Christ being fully man and fully God has not been properly laid. I know Henny is doing some work with you guys on that. Who's challenged by that work? No one. You are. There's two at least. Okay, so I can preach harder. If that doesn't challenge you, maybe I can try my best. Is that okay? Friends, we need to settle who Jesus is. And you cannot get 
The understanding of who Jesus is through your effort. You have to get it in humble submission saying, Holy Spirit, I need revelation here. What does it look like when you have the revelation of who Jesus is? Are you still hanging in? <clears throat> you still hanging in? Okay. If the, if the people shut up, Lord, the, the rocks will cry out. Thank you, Jesus. It's beautiful. There's one man that's excited about the Lord. It's wonderful. <laughs> So what does it look like if you have the revelation of who Jesus is? When you have revelation, you live to please God and you love people. If you have reasoning, you live to please people and to love God. Can I say that slowly again? Partij vir julle manne kyk vir my, dit is like, yes, die boete, ek gaan vir jou rol as die klaas. If you have the revelation of who Jesus is, then you live to please God and please God alone. You're not here to please people. You love people, but you don't please them. The church is not a place where we try and please people and accommodate everyone. The church is a place where we declare the radicalness of obedience of who God is and what he expects us to do. Little side note, you're not tithing for the next bit of information I'm going to give you. So it's for free. So you can sit back and relax and, and receive it, sir. The place where they're at is Caesarea Philippi. That's where Jesus asked them this question, who am I? Now we look at that and we think, yeah, I stay in Kruger's Dorp. It's like interesting. Same thing. It's not the same thing. Caesarea Philippi, the, these disciples are finding themselves at the grotto. as a grot in Afrikaans. Where a deity is being worshipped, the deity that's being worshipped in this place where the disciples find themselves is the deity called Pan. Pantheism comes from this God. Jesus is super strategic. He's walking with his disciples onto the territory of a deity of a God that's called Pan. Now you and I are like, okay, what the heck is that? So let me help you. Pan was a god in Greek mythology that was worshipped, that was half goat and half man. His legs were the legs of goats. His upper body was the, the body of a man and had these horns on his head. He got his name, Pan, from the Greek gods. His name Pan in, Af in Afrikaans means alles, in English means all. Interesting. Why did he get this name? Because the Greek gods were so pleased with Pan. Because the mixture of his body said all things goes together. This God really pleases us. We can mix all things together. You can't be radical. You can't be clear. This is the way. Pan is the God that gets worshipped in this place where all things goes. Anything goes. He's a God that is known for his lust, and he's a God that's known for his musical ability. Go have a look at him playing his flute on YouTube or on Google or on Wikipedia. <laughs> People worshipped him for the lust and for the music. Interesting enough, he's the God that they worship to get music creatively produced, to bless their hunting trips. So when they, so when they go out, they'd be successful in getting the hunt. And he's the guy that the shepherds come to, to get blessing on their sheep. So when that, that God is worshipped, what which three areas do you think he compromises in any church? <laughs> he, worship, he, he affects the music, he affects the shepherding, and he affects the business people. We don't hunt anymore, but when you do business Monday morning, any, are you not hunting for a next opportunity? Make sense? 
Why do we need to have the revelation of who Jesus is? Because with Jesus, not all things go. Jesus says, I am the way, I am the life, I am the truth. Bow your knee to me. I will unlock creativity to you in a way that you think, how is that possible? I will bless your business in a way that you think, no, I don't know how that can be. It is not natural. That's why it's called supernatural. The Lord will bless your loving of one another, your shepherding within the life of remembrance at a way that you think, oh my goodness, I felt like I've died and gone to heaven. So much love is in this place. I feel these three areas is where the enemy is trying to resist remembrance this morning. On your music, on your shepherding, and on your businessmen. So how do you how do you overcome it? You have to get the revelation of who Jesus is. You can't worship all things. All things are not equal. All things can't be tolerated. Some things need to be said. No, draw a line in the sand. Thank you very much for coming. Happy? Mad? Sad? Excited? When you get the revelation of who Jesus is, you please God alone. And you love people. Here's the reality. People can be sticky. People can be difficult. Sometimes people can just be a plain pain in the butt. That's why you need to just love them. Don't try and understand them. Don't try and reason with them. Don't try and please them. Just love them. Our world is confused right now. The identity issues in our world is all things goes. Whatever works for you. Well, that's not the way Jesus designed you. But I get that you're confused. So I'm not going to please you. I'm just going to love you. And put a little bit of truth in there for you. Because love and truth are not enemies. They're the same thing. You guys are right? You're right, Brood? If you're going to join Jesus in the build, what do you need to have revelation on? You need to have revelation on what Jesus is busy doing right now. What is he doing? Pruning. I thought that's the Father's work. God the Father. If I read John 15, the Father prunes. Jesus feels it. But it is something that God is doing. What is Jesus doing in the earth right now? Not God the Father, not God the Holy Spirit. What is Jesus doing in the earth right now? Bringing the kingdom. Here we go. Anyone else this side? I want to wake you up. I want to take up your theological abilities and shake them up and wake them up. He's building. What is he building? Woo. He's building his church. There's only two things that Jesus is busy doing on the earth right now. He's building his church and he's unlocking the influence of his kingdom. How are you doing? In joining Jesus on what he's doing in the earth right now. Or are you on your lone ranger horse, you and Tonto? Are you doing your own thing? How's that working for you? It's not a lot of fun. There's two things Jesus is doing. You have to get revelation on what Jesus is doing because your whole eternity and the reward of eternity hangs on those two things. Hear me? When you get a a revelation of who Jesus is, you get blessed. Why? You get taken out of the kingdom of darkness and you got birthed into the kingdom of light. Your eternity, you're going to make it to heaven when you get that revelation. How kind is the Lord to you? But there's no guarantee that when you're going to end up in heaven, there's going to be any reward waiting for you. Whoa, yes, the rock still no where you saw any. The fact that you got blessed with a revelation of who Jesus is gets you to the gates of heaven. If they ask you the question, why should I let you in? He said, you will not believe it, but I had a revelation that God died for me as a man. Can I please get access? 
And I don't know if it's Peter and Paul that's guarding the gates. I don't know what your theology is. I don't know. All I know is that when you give that answer, whoever is guarding the gates of heaven, so welcome, son of God, daughter of God. But unless you get revelation on what Jesus is doing now, there's no guarantee that you're going to have any reward when you step through the gates of heaven. That depends on the revelation and whether you have joined Jesus in what he's doing on the earth right now. now. Some theologians, some people try and explain this, and they try and belittle something that's so glorious, but they say when you, when you don't have reward, it's like you moving into a shack in Kahisu if there's no reward for you. But if you've joined Jesus in the work that he's doing on the earth, you'll walk up to a mansion and you're like, oh my goodness, Lord, who does this belong to? He says, here's the keys, it's yours. Now, I don't know whether it's going to play out like that. So please don't quote my theology. I'm trying to tell you what some theologians say. The point is this. When you step through the gates of heaven, what's waiting for you there? You see, the church needs to hear these things again, sir. This life is coming to an end. I want to give you insider trading. I want to give you insider trading. The investments on this earth is going to all crash at some point. But the investments for eternity is going to stand forever. Be wise. Be wise. Join Jesus in what he's doing on the earth. Invest your life. Invest your time. Invest your talents. Invest your money. So that you can translate it into eternity where moth and rust does not touch it. Have you got that revelation? So why is it that the church is so about me, 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 me? The unholy trinity. Me, myself, and I. Why is it that some people choose to serve coffee on a Sunday morning while the rest just say, oh, I've got a little bit of time. I can go past Starbucks and I'll just pitch at church. I hope he entertains me today. <clears throat> See, you haven't got a revelation on what Jesus is doing right now. He's building his church and he's advancing his kingdom. He's influencing his kingdom and he's saying, come, join me. How do you join Jesus in building his kingdom? You have to get agreement with him. The kingdom operates on agreement. When was the first time that you made agreement with Jesus? Huh? When was the first time? Can you think of the first time you made agreement with Jesus? You accepted him. How about you guys? When was the first time you made agreement with Jesus? What about you, sir? When was the first time you made agreement with Jesus? Wow. And what happened? Wow. Can I tell you how my first agreement looked? I was 14 years old. My dad has passed away two months before. I'm at a Passion Weekend conference, and the pastor is preaching a real turn of burn message. I don't know if it was as turning and burning as mine is this morning, but he was turning and burning us. And he said this at the end. He says, listen, if you don't get up today to acknowledge Jesus, he will not get up one day to acknowledge you. All of a sudden, the conviction of the Holy Spirit hit me. I've been in church for 14 years. All of a sudden, the conviction of the Spirit hits me and say, I cannot afford that. Let me just make agreement. Let me just get up and stand before people. I don't even know what I'm saying. I just want to say, Jesus, I acknowledge you. Please save me. First agreement made. Where does your first agreement start? It starts when the Holy Spirit says, hey, you're a sinner. You're in trouble. You need Jesus. Stop fighting him. This is not last night's pizza. This is the conviction of Jesus saying, I'm knocking at your door and I want to come in. Please agree. Open the door for me. And then I had to learn that to operate in his kingdom, there's many other agreements I had to make with Jesus still today. 
When the Lord called us to ministry, I had to go to my wife. She's half my size, but double the dynamite. I had to go to her and say, listen, the Lord is calling us. He's calling us to go build his church. Can we just get some agreement on this? Would you agree with me that we can follow Jesus this way? I can't promise you anything. As a matter of fact, I'm, I'm trembling on the inside because I'm afraid that I might make you a beggar's wife. My wife got up. She said, listen, man, you're foolish. Not for saying yes to the call for worrying about us being beggars. Man, you need a wife next to you, next to you like that. Hey, remember us. I think it can do better than that. There's half a response there, but I think this side. So here's the thing. If you want to be a part of his kingdom, you're going to have to learn to agree constantly. Constantly. Why? Because unless you agree with your wife, with your spouse, with your kids, we're following Jesus now. You can't be available to join him in the building work. And I say that slowly again. If you want the kingdom's influence to be unlocked through your life, you have to live a life of agreement. Lord, you say I must love. I want to knock their teeth out now. But I agree with you. I'll just love and smile on them. I can see you never get there. To be a part of the kingdom, you have to learn to walk in agreement. To be a part of Jesus building the church in remembrance, you're going to have to make yourself available. How available are you? How available are you when the church calls a prayer meeting? Say, oh, yeah, you know what? I, I'm a business guy. I can't get there. Watch out for the deceitfulness of wealth. The Bible warns you. You think if I have more bucks, I'll be able to manage when disease and death come. Let me give you another insider trading tip. When death and disease comes visiting, your money is going to mean squat. Only the resurrection life and power of Jesus will help you in that moment. You might as well get generous with your bucks. If you want to join the kingdom, you have to agree. If you want to be part of what Jesus is doing, he's busy building church, his church at remembrance. It's not Henny's church. It's not my church. I wish sometimes it was. I could slap some stuff. <laughs> Can't. It's his. It's his bride. If you want to be part of Jesus building his church, you're going to have to look at your calendar. You're going to have to look at your time. You're going to have to say, I'm not available or I am. Jesus, use me. I'm available. I don't want a preaching slot. I just want to be available. Wherever you want to use me, Henny. Wherever the elders want to use me, I'm, I'm sticking up, man. Please, Lord, I'm available. Use me. Is that no graag gemaakt? Happy? Sir, are you still happy? You still awake? Okay, beautiful. There's two of you I got with one shot there. <laughs> Here's the thing. When you have revelation on what Jesus is doing, it feeds your obedience. It feeds your obedience. The Lord asked me in the beginning of the journey, he says, Yannis, I want to teach you faith. I'm like, yes, Lord, I'm in. He says, give your old 500,000 kilometer Ford Courier away. That was a red, looked like a fire station. We called it the passion wagon. Because it had a mattress at the back. <laughs> that our kids slept in when we came from Premier League. <laughs> Please get your minds out of the gutter. <laughs> Lord says to me, Yanis, I want to give you that, that passion wagon away. It's like, yes, Lord, I want to learn faith, but I don't know if I'm that desperate to learn it. <laughs> but when you get revelation on what Jesus is doing, revelation feeds your obedience. It's like, Lord, this makes no sense. I'm going to walk. I need to get from Edenvale to the West Strand because you're starting something. Now you're asking me to give my vehicle away. Am I going to walk, Lord? Do you want me to walk? He 
She went to get revelation and feed your obedience. For five months, my sister borrowed her little Opal Corsa bucket to me. That's one of those I strapped on when I pull into it, and I strap it off when I get to the West Road. And then after five months, the Lord blessed me with a vehicle. So unique, it's not even manufactured anymore. It was a black Saab. I don't know if you would even know what that is. It had a three-liter engine in it. Turbo, petrol. Not a diesel turbo, petrol turbo. Automatic gearbox. Low-profile tires, white Interior leather seating. I'm like, Jesus. I'm a farm boy. How the heck is this going to help me? The Lord says, careful now, my son. Careful now. I've, I'm upgrading you to who you are in your identity. You want to settle for things that I don't see over your life. Look at that vehicle. It's powerful. It's sleek. It handles. It's quick. That's how I see you. I want to transform your identity. I want to upgrade you to how I see you because you're not seeing yourself the way I see you. Now, it's so much fun to tell you the story and you think, yes, that's so cool. It wasn't fun for five months. But revelation feeds your obedience. When you get revelation, it's like the Lord must have something so much better because I know he's good. So what do you want me to give, Lord? Okay, Lord, you can't have my toothbrush, toothbrush and my wife, but everything else, it's yours, Lord. That's radical. How radical do you want to be? Revelation feeds your obedience. Reasoning. <laughs> Watch out for it. Reasoning feeds your opinion. I don't think this, and I don't think that, and I don't think this, and I don't think that. And Jesus says, luckily, I'm not asking you to lead my church. Because I don't care what you think. What I think matters. I paid for her. It cost me my life. You know, it's easy and lazy boys here by the membranes. You're right. Then, if you want to join Jesus in building, you don't only need revelation on who Christ is, on, on what, he, what He is doing right now. You need to get revelation on what He has already done. What did Jesus do? What, what has He done already? When you get this revelation, everything in your life starts to shift. When Jesus tried to explain this revelation to Peter, listen what Jesus says to him. He says, Peter, you must understand that I must go to Jerusalem to suffer many things at the hands of men, that I must be killed and that I must be raised on the third day to life. When you get a revelation what Jesus did for you on the cross, you'll join him in his building work. When you get a revelation that he had to suffer as a sacrifice for you. You get a revelation that at the cross, he is God in human form being sacrificed, suffering for you. Suffering as your substitute. You should have been the one hanging on that cross, taking all the suffering, all the punishment, all the wrath of God for your disobedience. You should have been the one taking the punishment. Jesus says, no, 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 no. I'll take that for you. You'll get the benefit. I will pay for the disobedience of your sin. I'll pay for it. So your sin is paid for. Your ticket for heaven is booked if you believe this truth. Your reward is not guaranteed, but your ticket is booked. You're going to make it. 
Some days you feel, I don't think so, I don't know. Does he know about this? Does he know about that? What about this? He's paid for it. Happiness? Most of the church is happy with that, that Jesus paid for your sin. But do you know there's something else that happens at the cross? So you're like, oh, what can that be? At the cross, he does not just die as your substitute. At the cross, he dies as your representative. What does it mean to have a representative? Simple way to explain it. If I want to buy a cold drink and I'm lazy and my boy is with me, I stop at the engine garage, I give him my money and I say, bro, please go buy me a Coke Zero. I ask him to go represent me in the shop. He's got my money. He's got my permission. He goes out. He gets the Coke Zero, comes back. What has happened? He represented me in the engine quick shop. It is as good as if I was buying the Coke myself. You have to get this one. The church misses this one. He's not just dying for you. He's dying as you. You've died. That's what faith says. I died with him two, more than 2,000 years ago. When he died on that cross, he was my replacement. He was my substitute. But oh my goodness, he also died as me. I died to the old way of thinking. I died to reasoning. I died to having opinions. I died to all the things that the flesh wants to tell me I've got entitlement to. This is the challenge. Dying to self. You see, the cross is a powerful tool. It's a powerful tool. The cross is the place where you got redeemed. You weren't right with God. You were wrong with God. When you believe in the cross and that sacrifice for you and as you, you become right with God. You can access him in friendship. When you believe in what the cross has done for you, you can enter rest. You can start to live with peace and joy. We start to believe in the cross that Jesus did it for you. You can start to rule. I like the ruling bit. Because when you confront a demon, you tell that demon where it needs to go in Jesus' name. You're not fasting and praying and calling a prayer meeting. You say, in Jesus' name, move. Am I losing you, sir? I don't need you to lose me. I need to have your heart open. I need you to have your heart open. The cross is not just a redemption tool. It's a transformational tool. Everything, everything, everything of your life gets transformed. Everything gets transformed. When you get revelation on what he has done on the cross, you know what it leads to? It leads to you taking up your image and likeness, the way God originally designed you to operate. To carry his image. What's the image of God? He's a creator. You hang out with him, you start to create like him. How did he create? By the spirit hovering and him speaking the word. How will you create? By the spirit hovering over your body and you speak. Oh my goodness. Have you got that revelation on what happened at the cross? At the cross, your image, God's image got restored in you. His likeness, you can start to work like God. Oh my goodness. Some of you are like, nee, yes, you nee. What track you here out? Do you know that? You get revelation on what he has done for you, your life starts to look different. The pressures that comes your way, you deal with them different. The stuff that people want to accuse you of and the stuff that's, that's troubles or troubles in your work, you deal with those things different. Your relationships look different. Why? Because the image of God is restored to you. The likeness of God is restored over your life. 
But if you reason, if you want to reason with a cross, it leads you to religion and to rules. I can do this, I can't do this, I can't do that, I can't do it. We must start church here, we must stop church there because otherwise it's not right. And he, and he must preach a certain way, otherwise if he preaches something else, it's not lappy. I don't want to call a elders meeting to confront them. And it becomes about rules and not relationship anymore. So now it's time to raise the dead. I'm done. You happy if I minister on this, Eddie? So if you're here this morning and you don't have the revelation of who Jesus is, my goodness, what an opportunity to invite you. I just want to warn you, I'm not going to make it easy on you. If you're, this morning, if you're here this morning and your life is not right with Jesus, you need to sort your life out with Jesus. You need to recognize him as your Lord and as your Savior. Do you know that he was publicly humiliated for you? It wasn't something that happened in a little back corner. He was publicly punished, humiliated for you. So if you want the benefits of saying, Jesus is my Lord and Savior, I need him to save me, I want to ask you to get up from your chair and join me in the front. Wonderful. So you've got a different desire. We'll, we'll help you in a moment. I love his desire, though. Who else? Saying, like, man, I'm not right with Jesus. I've never had this revelation that I must believe that he's God and that he's man. If you're here this morning, you've come to an amazing meeting. All you need to do is say, man, Jesus, help me. I want to get my first agreement in place. Stop fighting him. Agree with him. I need Jesus. Lord, this morning I come. Anyone else? And by the way, I'm not auctioning Jesus off. It's not like going once, going twice, going three times. So please don't come to me after me and say, yes, I, 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 I should have been the one. You have an opportunity now. Is it radical and uncomfortable? Yes. Was it radical and uncomfortable for Jesus to die at the cross? Yes. I felt to minister this morning over those who are ministering in the music. Would you come? Just join me on the left here. Those that, that's ministering at Remembrance at the moment and the music team, those that have got a desire, man, you'd like to. You'd like to even pick up a banjo and strum it a little bit. Just come and join me to the left here if you don't mind. If you're part of the music, I believe there's something radical but simple that the Lord is going to unlock through your music. Because all things are not equal in the kingdom. Because <laughs> Jesus is superior. Is that all right? I have to minister over a businessman. You've got a business. Maybe the best way to do this is to, to get you to stand. It should probably be the most of us. Just if you've got a business, just stand. Mm. Okay. So this might sound a little bit crazy. Can I do crazy? Business guys, I know this is a gray carpet. Would you mind to come stand on the carpet? So this morning the Lord wants to take the gray carpet and give you a red carpet to walk on. So if you're a music team, business guy, it's like a big decision to make now, eh? <laughs> so can, can I ask you just to, to sort of leave a gap just stand on the sides of the carpet so it's just easier to minister um, because I do feel there's a laying on of hands that's needed this morning to break some stuff open and if you're in this row and you're part of the music team then once we've done this you can go back there is that okay then over the shepherding team those who are called to have coffee with people if you, if you could have your choice you could serve Jesus in one way. It'll be for you just to be able to sit with people, love on people, encourage people. That's you. I'd love for you to join me on the right here by the piano. 
Okay, now there's three teams. Wonderful, man. Shepherds, those who feel there's a shepherding, they would love to just sit with people, love on people. Just stand by the piano if you don't mind, ma'am, just to make sure that we get to. Wonderful. Wow. Wow. This is beautiful. Wonderful. Wonderful. <laughs> if you're still seated and you haven't responded to any one of these, I'd love for you just to stand where you're at. For those that are standing in the chairs, I want to ask you, Lord, I want to ask you to have this conversation with the Lord. Lord, this morning, make, make agreement with him about you being available to serve his body. Is that all right? Have a conversation with Jesus saying, Lord, I really want to be available for what you're building here at Remembrance. I don't know where, I don't know where to start. Would you, would you speak to me? You happy to have that conversation with him? So Holy Spirit, we welcome you this morning. Thank you for the word. Thank you that we can respond on the word this morning, Lord. I thank you for hearts that's burning this morning. I thank you for hearts that's burning. We pray, Lord, as we lay hands on people this morning, that impartation will happen, that release would happen, creativity would be released. We bless you this morning, Lord. Oh, we bless you this morning. Jesus bless you. Jesus bless you. If you're comfortable to pray in tongues, great moment for you just to start to be praying in tongues. You don't have to go loud. Just speak under your breath. If you're a visitor this morning, we're not going into fruitcake phase. We're just actually allowing our spirits to connect with the Holy Spirit so that he can speak to us. It becomes easier that way. We don't need anyone to interpret this moment. It's just us strengthening ourselves. So I want to ask Rudo, would you mind just to go past this group of guys and lay hands on them? Yes, for, for anointing around business, just to be released. Um, Fred, Yolanda, would you mind to come and just lay hands on the, on the shepherds? I'm going to join you in a moment. And then I'll let, can we pray for the creativity of music? And here's how you, here's how you respond. When people come to you to pray, don't, don't be praying in tongues. Now you receive. Have you ever tried to drink water and talk at the same time? You tried that before. You can't do that. You must choose. You're either drinking or you're talking. So speak in tongues. Someone comes to you to lay hands. Just open yourself up to say, Lord, I receive. Is that all right? Thank you for taking the time to listen, and we hope you've been blessed. For more information, visit readchurchza.com.